there is a famine in our land. It's not a famine for food. It's not a famine for water. But it's a famine for genuine, heartfelt repentance. We have an adversary. You know, the Bible says that Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's a master at it. And we can go two ways. We can either see a devil under every rock and be paranoid all day long, which is wrong. Or we can be so naive, undiscerning of his tactics. And the Bible teaches us about his tactics. And I believe America is suffering greatly because we have lost, we've lost the heart and understanding what it means to really repent. And the Lord definitely has given me this message. And I, I, I know, I just trust that you'll hear it the way he gave it to me. This picture represents the prodigal son and his father. You've read that story probably many times. And you can see the emotion in the picture. The question I want to ask is what brought this boy home? I don't think you're really going to be surprised, but, but I want to really look at something you may not have given that much attention to. We tend to really look at the father. And it's, it's true that the father in this, in this story does represent our heavenly father. But do you notice the father didn't go out running to the pig pen and get him and drag him home? The father stayed at home. But let's read this and, and look what we're going to see. When he finally came to his senses, that phrase is very, very important. He said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am, dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. And I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. That's what brought him home. Was brokenness, desperation, overwhelming conviction. That's what brought him home. Please, Take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. I believe that phrase is real important because it does show you that this is representing our heavenly father. There's no way that his earthly father could see him coming from a long way off. That represents God. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. That's what brought him home. This overwhelming conviction. That's what we were... There's a famine in our land. When was the last time you really witnessed overwhelming conviction where somebody spoke in the same passion that this young man spoke with? When he finally came to his senses. That phrase is so powerful. It's repeated in the Bible again. Here's the picture, and there's a world of people that need to come to their senses. A world of people. We're a nation just desperate for people to come to their senses. And the Lord, this is, Paul wrote this to Timothy, and look, notice what he said. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance. If God doesn't grant repentance, no one's ever going to turn around. It'll be impossible. Leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses. There you see it again. And escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. A few weeks ago, I shared a, a message that really dealt with, in that message, it dealt with how people are denying that, that there is sin anymore. In other words, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, he took care of it 2,000 years ago, don't worry about it. That just breaks my heart that we would even think that way. That we would think that way. It's like Sue and I, when we got married almost 49 years ago, 
I could say, well, I told you on that day I loved you. And if I ever change my mind, I'll let you know. Now, wouldn't that be sick? Wouldn't that be stupid? Well, that's the kind of attitude we are with God. When we think, well, I don't, I don't ever need to repent anymore. How could you say that? You break the heart of God. If you, we're doing stuff all the time that's not right. And we're just going to blow it off and act like that's no big deal. It's a big deal. We don't understand how much God literally hates sin. Billy Graham. I just love this man so much. He's with the Lord. He's no longer here and you know that. But I loved him. I still to this day listen to many of his messages. It's called The Classics of Billy Graham. And Billy Graham, he would so often in his messages, he would really speak to, the, to church people and say, you're probably going to church. You may be a pastor, an elder. It doesn't mean that you really know Jesus Christ. Billy Graham, he said this in public. This is a statement he made. Billy Graham publicly stated that he hoped that at least 5% of people who came forward at his meetings were genuinely saved. He understood that without genuine repentance, a person isn't saved. I mean, we, we just we treat it so cheaply. This bothers me. And I, don't, I don't want you to see this picture as a, a worship time. I want you to see this picture as a pastor up front, giving an invitation and saying, is there anybody here tonight that's never been saved? If you've never been saved, raise your hand. I just grieve when this goes on. I grieve. It's not right. It's wrong. Now, it can, you can use it to start off with, but listen, the pastor or leader should make this very clear that this is only a baby step. For those who raise their hands, it should be required that after the service, they should have a special meeting to explain the cost in giving your life to Jesus Christ. In churches all over America, it's cheap. It's absolutely cheap. We treat salvation, and that's even a word for you and I. We should be farmers planting seed, but don't always try to go out and, and, and reap the crop. Because when you do that, most likely you're doing something that shouldn't even be done. You'll know when it's time. One of the worst things you can do is give somebody the impression that they're saved when they're not. Just because they repeat some words, you might say, well, would you like to go to heaven? You know, I went to Mardi Gras for 13 years. And it used to grieve me. I mean, not everybody was like this. There was one man in particular. He was very big. He was a large man. He was very intimidating. He would go out and he would come back and say, I led 13 people to Jesus today. Well, here's how he would do it. He would get somebody kind of cornered and he'd start saying, wouldn't you like to go to heaven? Come on, don't you want to go to heaven? And he had the conversation with going. He said, listen, all you got to do, all you got to do is repeat these words and you can go to heaven. Wouldn't you do that to go to heaven? Well, he's big, intimidating. And if somebody told me, all you got to do is repeat these words, okay? Just repeat the words. And you're going to heaven. That's damning. I can't believe somebody would do that. And it would used to grieve me terribly when that happens. But just like in a church service like this, if you're going to have people raise their hands, wonderful. I expect every one of you that raised your hand to meet me in this room back here after the service. And then really pour your heart out and say, guys, do you understand what this means? Do you understand the cost of giving your life to Jesus Christ? We're living in a land where we, we promote a no-cost discipleship. And it's wrong. It's wrong. Jesus never played with the crowd. He never enticed anybody. He never did. He would often try to discourage people. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you, have, you, you can't even follow me. Buddy, the whole crowd turned around and left. But today, we wouldn't dare say anything that could discourage somebody. Some of the greatest conversions happen when people are by themselves. It doesn't have to be. People can be saved all kinds of different ways. I'm not... Matter of fact, Billy Graham was saved in a meeting in a church. I'm not putting that down. But you know what? Most people that I know, when they had such a deep conversion, they were just like these pictures you see right here. They were alone. 
They poured out their heart and soul to God. Now, somebody had to sow something into their hearts. Somebody prayed for them, interceded, sowed. We should see ourselves as sowers. We're farmers, and we're sowing seed all the time. A man by John C. says this very well. Sin is unpopular. Pastors want to fill the seats of their church. Talking about sin leaves people with a bad taste in their mouth. It's much nicer to teach that God loves everyone, that Christ died for everyone, and that God has a wonderful plan for you. How many times has that been said over and over and over? And he does. I'm not denying this. Throw in a few lessons about morality that hardly anyone will object to, and you have a recipe for a full congregation nearly every Sunday. How true that is. Our spiritual language has changed and not for the better. This was written by Jim Baker, and that's not the Jim Baker that you know that used to be on TV. This is another Jim Baker. Our spiritual language changes over time. Read the religious classics, and we find these spiritual saints speak of a relationship with God and Christ, using a language with which we are unfamiliar. Just in my lifetime, the Christian church language has changed from having a personal relationship with Jesus to studying about Jesus, from following Jesus to worshiping Jesus, from personal prayer to corporate prayer, from fellowship to community, from evangelism to being missional, from discipleship to spiritual growth, and from being Christ-like to being Christ-centered. You say, Todd, it's all the same. No, there's a slight twist. And, it, and it, what it does, it kind of goes from the heart to the head. The other, the, you know, the previous words that he was using is from the heart. But the other words is from the head. From the head. Oh, I'm studying about, I'm really studying about Jesus. You ought to get down on your face and cry out for him. Get to know him. That's what you need to do. Modern day spiritual language softens what God hates. We forget God hates sin. He hates it. Why do we embrace it? Why do we kind of downplay it? We kind of make excuses for it. Listen to this. And this was written by Roger D. Campbell. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. In God's plan, only his son's blood can provide a remedy and healing for man's sin. Regardless of the words which humans might use to portray it, sin is destructive, divisive, and deadly. Sin is ugly. It has unpleasant consequences in this life. But most importantly, sin can separate sinners eternally from the Godhead. When our Savior lived on the earth, he spoke plainly about sin and its consequences. He openly declared that an evil man brings forth evil things from the evil treasure of his heart. In similar language, he said, that evil things come within and defile a man. Jesus did not shy away from calling sin what it is, sin. It's not uncommon in our day for people to speak about matters that violate the teachings of the Bible in such a way that transgressions do not sound so bad after all. The devil often uses this ploy. If he can cause people to tone down the rhetoric about evil, then maybe evildoers will remain comfortable in their sin and not be motivated to forsake it resulting in their souls being lost eternally because their sins have never been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Portraying wickedness in a way that softens the sound of it causes people to look at it as if it's not all that serious. We are masters at it in our society. If a Christian man constantly speaks and treats others in a harsh and uncompassionate manner, someone might say, well, that is just his character. He gets a little carried away trying to justify his failure to show kindness, common courtesy, is not acceptable. A brother in the Lord goes nuts on the road, screaming and yelling any time that a driver cuts in front of him with, here's a hard vehicle. Some would say, well, he kind of gets upset. No, the man fails to bridle his tongue. How serious is that? It is sinful, and it causes one's religion to be in vain on a regular basis. A married woman sleeps with a man who is not her husband. 
The Bible calls such activity adultery and states that adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of God. In modern times, some would say that this woman has wandering eyes or is having an extramarital affair or a midlife crisis. The truth is she's an adulteress. The Bible teaches that drunkards will not inherit God's kingdom. If we say, well, he enjoys his liquor, or he has a little drinking problem, such language is not helping the drunkard. It actually might embolden him. God hates a lying tongue and charges us to speak the truth. Enter the word misspeak. People use that word when they try to downplay their dishonesty. If a person has told a lie, he may say, I misspoke. That does not sound as bad as lie, does it? Here is a historical example. It's a true story. 20 years ago, a world-famous person made a trip to a war-torn country in Europe. Her initial version of events was that her plane landed under fire, and she had to duck and run to her vehicle. However, television footage shows her disembarking with a smile, waving to the crowd, and strolling across the tarmac to greet a little girl who read her a poem. Oh, oh, she was caught in a lie. In reference to how she originally described what happened, a short time later, she corrected herself. I did misspeak the other day. Madam, you lied. In Bible language, if one goes to bed with a human who is not his or her spouse, that's called fornication. That sounds too intolerant, too condemning, and too old-fashioned. Instead, they call it living together, spending the night, or having a partner. What is taking place? God forbidden sex. God hates hands that shed innocent blood, which is an accurate description of what happens when an unborn human is aborted on purpose. Today, when an expecting female has an abortion performed, it is said that she made a choice not to have the baby. In truth, what did she do? She paid someone to murder the human inside her womb. Language makes a different people, and we're masters at it. We live in a country. You know what? <clears throat> God hates sin as much as he ever did. How many people live together? Just absolutely. You can go to churches, and a lot of the people in the church, they're living together. Pastor doesn't say anything about it. Not that big a deal. It's a big deal. We live in a society where they don't think it's a big deal, but God still does. You know, God's not mod. He's not woke. He's not, he's not charismatic with a society. We really have it twisted around. Pardon me for just a moment. <clears throat> Genuine repentance cleansed this lady's heart and soul. I love this. Absolutely love it. This is her testimony. At the church that night, I gave him my will and my mind, but it wasn't until the next day that I gave him my heart. The lay speaker had promised what God was going to make me different, that God was going to make me different. I thought in order to make my life different, he sure had to change some of my relatives. I thought God was just going to snap a finger and my husband was going to fall at my feet and we would have peace. I thought my sister, who had always argued with me, would admit I was right. I thought my kids would instantly obey and we would have peace. But you know, that isn't his plan of salvation at all. He didn't touch them or change them. He changed me and my attitude toward them. I don't know if this happens in every Christian's life, but it happened in mine. Jesus asked me to kneel, but I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know what he was going to pull next. So I said with all my heart, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he said, what's the worst sin you've ever committed? And call it by its right name. You know what? This is rare. This is rare because we teach generic repentance. This is like to stand up. Put your hand up. Pray after me. I'm a sinner. Is that it? 
You know, with my precious wife, throughout our marriage, and maybe this, I'm sure it's happened in, in your marriage, there's times you have little spats. We've had a beautiful marriage, but we're human. We're both human. There's been times I've offended or said something to Sue and hurt her. And I knew it. And I'd say, oh, honey, I'm sorry. And she'd look at me and say, you don't mean it. <laughs> you know, the truth was, she, she nailed it. It was just, I'm sorry. And then there's other times when, oh, I feel it. Sweetheart, what I said was wrong. It was wrong. I'm so sorry. And she says, thank you, honey. I know you mean that. You know, we do that with God. We do it with God. How can we be so flippant about it? Oh, sorry about that, God. What's wrong with us? If I'm that way with my wife, how much more with God? We're so worried. We're so worried about condemnation. We don't want any conviction because we might feel condemned. We need to feel condemned for a while. Oh, what's wrong with us? She goes on to say, it was so hard for me to say it out loud to Jesus, but I finally just said it. Now, I didn't feel any club over my head. He said, what's the next thing? The next thing. The next thing. He took me back to every lie I ever told, every bad thing I've ever done, and it was an awful, awful time. I couldn't dare remember all the things in my horrible life. But with God's help, I'm sure he can bring it back to your mind. <clears throat> I don't ever want to go through a thing like that again. I heard someone say after going through a, an experience like mine, Oh, Lord, I'm not fit to live. And Jesus said, Who told you that you have been living? Now I'm going to show you what life's all about. I'm going to send you joy, peace, and love. And you're going to be a joyful person. He just makes a new person. Generic repentance might get you into heaven, but it sure is shallow. Don't ever, please don't ever, I mean, listen to the Holy Spirit, but I can tell you right now, there, it would be, you know, we always refer to the man on the cross. But did you ever realize that the man on the cross was in a real predicament? <laughs> we say, well, he didn't do this. He did, well, of course. What's he going to do? He's on the cross dying. He's only got just a short time to live. But I still believe that he didn't just have this real short conversation with Jesus. They were, on the, they were on those crosses a long time. I believe he said a lot to Jesus that's not recorded in the Bible. This is, what, this is what Jesus said. If we claim, no, I'm sorry, this is what John said in 1 John. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But, if we confess our, is it singular or plural? Plural. plural. And I even enlarged it just a little bit. If we confess our sins, I remember, and it happened in February of 1973. Can I quote back every bit of the prayer? I can't. But it's like a video in my head. And I can see I was prostrated on my bed. I came home from leave. It's a long story. But I felt my mom, I just got done talking with my mom. She said, son, go in your room and everything you told me, tell Jesus. And I went in there and I prostrated myself across my bed. I said, oh God, I'm not fit to live. And I really meant it. I meant it. I saw myself as just an ate up piece of junk. And I fell across the bed and I poured my heart. I said, God, I'm gonna, I don't even know if you want me, but I can, I'm going to give my life to you. I poured my heart out to God. But we try to lead people through this little 30 second, just say, God, you're sorry, and ask him to forgive you. What's wrong with us? That's cheap. It's not, it's like Sue telling me, you didn't mean that. You didn't mean that. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Look at that. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we're calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. Listen, I want to say this so strongly. We had this conversation a few weeks ago. Don't you ever buy into this junk that if you're a Christian, all your sin was nailed to the cross 2,000 years ago. It's all done. It's all done. It's done theoretically. 
But every day that you do something wrong, you better quickly say, oh, God, I'm sorry. What if you say something? You might say something. This is like those examples. What if you are driving and somebody does something and you get mad? Oh, God, forgive me. If you have the attitude, well, that's already been forgiven. That's the devil of hell giving you that kind of thinking. That's wrong. It's wrong from the pit of hell. It's wrong. I don't even know if I read this. We have not sinned. We are calling him a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. I'm going to show you a picture of this beautiful lady who shared that testimony. This lady right here. Isn't she beautiful? That's my mom. That's my precious mom. And <laughs> I love her to pieces. She's with the Lord right now. But isn't she beautiful? And, and she had such a beautiful, life-changing experience with Jesus Christ. What does genuine repentance look like? What does it look like? Then Jesus, now this, this is Jesus. Then Jesus told this story to some of, who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorn everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood up by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people. Cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that old tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I'm a sinner. I know pastors that if this guy would go to a pastor and share, share how broken they are, the pastor would say, Now that's not of God. That's, God doesn't want you to feel that way. Come on. That's the devil making you feel like that. That's the kind of garbage that's infiltrating our modern religious thinking. I hope you really see that. I've seen it personally. I know of people that would come for counseling and say, well, I went to this one guy. I've been really troubled and bothered. And he said, well, you shouldn't be here. Are you a Christian? Yeah, well, you shouldn't be troubled. They come to me and I say, well, praise God you're troubled. Let's find out why. Let's pray. Something's wrong. And then you find out, yep, they've been hiding something. There's something there. But see, we're all so hung up on us. We're so hung up on us. We always want to feel good. Don't be condemned. Always smile. Always leave on a crescendo, high note. I spoke at a church not long ago for a while. One of the, one of the leaders told me, you know, it's always good to end on a high note. I said, you know, it's good to live, to leave sometimes when people are crying and broken. Where do we get this idea that everything has to be on a high note? Boy, it wasn't on a high note with Jesus all the time. What's wrong with us? Back up just a second. I tell you, this is Jesus speaking. This sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. And I just told you, many churches, this kind of repentance is discouraged because it's uncomfortable, because you might feel condemned. Well, yeah, there's a difference. The Bible says there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. But you know what? For a season, there may have to be some condemnation to get some conviction. We don't dare want to feel bad. So that's why the church in America is dead. I mean practically dead. Don't judge it by how loud somebody's singing, how high they're jumping, or how many people are in their church. You judge revival on how many people are weeping and crying and confessing their sin. That's when God's moving. I've heard people say, oh, God's really moving here, moving there. I remember a few years ago, there was this laughing revival that took place in Canada, and then it went down to Florida. Y'all remember that? Sick. Oh, so it's big revival. They're laughing and laughing. Oh, yeah. And you know who's really laughing? The devil standing back saying, boy, I got him right where I want him. No lives changed, but they're having a good time laughing. Look what happened on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. 
Then Peter stepped forward with the eleven other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, so let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierce their hearts. People, that's what we need. We don't always need to be encouraged. Encouraged. I understand encouragement, but you know, that's all we want. People will go to church if they can get encouraged. They don't, they don't dare want to be convicted. They just want to be encouraged. They don't dare want the Spirit of God to just take their lives over. People, that's what we need. And they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? That When your heart is pierced, that's the response. Oh God, oh God, oh God, what do you want from me? I don't want to hold anything back. Nothing. I don't want to hold anything back. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. Here's a real question. Why are we so indifferent to sin? Why are we so nonchalant? Let's just real be honest. You know that's true. You know in your gut it's true. Things just don't bother us that much. It's no big deal. We have the mentality, I'd rather my, I'd, you know what? Let me explain something. Just like here in this auditorium, if this auditorium was filled and three quarters that were filled with, with people that lost this, I'd be thrilled to death. I would be thrilled to death to be able to speak to a crowd like that. But this is what pastors do. If there's people like that in your group, don't dare say anything to keep them from coming back. You see the difference? It's a world of difference, everybody. It's a world of difference. The thing is, you speak the truth. If you have people living together in church, don't be afraid to say, you know what, it's sin. If you're not married, it's sin. And if they come up to the pastor afterwards, say, you know, we can fix this real easy. Let's just get married right now. Why don't you just get married right now? We live in a society where so many people aren't married because of our, our government that says, well, if you're married, then one of you can no longer get a check. Well, you know what? Don't get it. Please God, and God's going to make a way. It's junk to think that, you know, God understands. Oh, he does. He really understands. He's saying, get married. Don't worry about your money. Don't you believe I can take care of your money? Oh, I believe you wouldn't do that. I believe that we need to stay unmarried so we can both pull our check. That's the church in America, people. That's why we're not experiencing heartfelt, genuine repentance and a true awakening of God. The conscience in man has become desensitized. Now the Bible talks about the conscience being seared. And that's really referring to people that don't even, don't even know God. But yet, there, there is a, a desensitizing taking place within the body of Christ. A desensitizing where it doesn't bother us. just doesn't bother us that bad. You know, God understands. That's, I hate that phrase. If you really think about it, God does understand. He really understands. Jesus said this. Sin will be rampant everywhere. And the love of many. I've got to pause. I've highlighted that. Get your strong concordance that you got, probably. And look this up in Strong's. Look up that word love and look back in Greek. And the Greek word for love used there is agape. And then I challenge you. You look at every place in the Bible where agape is used. And it's never, never used referring to an unsaved person. The only place agape love is used is with believers who have the love of God in them because they have the Holy Spirit in them. But listen to this. Sin will be rampant and the love of many. That means Christians, just, the Bible says that there's going to be a great apostasy. There's going to be a great falling away in the end times before he comes back. We're there. I see it everywhere. I see people, I see it. Probably because I'm 72 years old. And I've been in a ministry for 51 years. Well, I've been saved for 51, 49 in the ministry. And I, I've, I've watched people 
And I, I remember when they were on fire for God. And now I don't see the fire. I think, oh God, what's happened? What's happened? The love of many will go cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. The casual use of such words as love and hate has emptied them of their meaning. We no longer understand statements that describe a loving God who hates sin. So, we picture God as gentle and kind, a cosmic pushover. And our concept of what he hates is tempered by our misconceptions and wishful thinking. The words of the prophets stand in stark contrast to such misconceptions. God's hatred is real, burning, consuming, and destroying. He hates sin. And he stands as the righteous judge, ready to mete out just punishment to all who defy his rule. God's love is also real, so real that he sent his son, the Messiah, to save and accept judgment in the sinner's place. Love and hate are together, both unending, irresistible, and unfathomable. Let me say for a moment, God is love, isn't he right? We say it all the time. Love is God. No way. No way. No way. God is love, but don't ever say love is God, because love is not God. But we've made it a God. We've made love a God. I was talking to somebody here recently, and we were talking about a church that he attends, and he says, oh, there's just so much love. There's just a lot of love. There's just a lot of love. He really doesn't care for the pastor at all. And they never, I asked him, I said, Do you ever, does your pastor ever preach about sin? No, no, not really. But we have a lot of love. And, and it hit me the other day. I said, God, this is where we're at. We, this, is how, this is how clever the devil of hell is. If he can just get us to feel love and just compassion and love, oh, that's where God's at. Do you see? That's not true. Listen. I'm not saying that we don't need to have a whole bunch of love, but we think just because we love each other, we, can, we kind of put God on the back burner because we just love each other. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because it's very real. The church is, I'm talking about the church universal people, really across the world. I've got a dear friend in Uganda, Sorote, Uganda. I love this young man. I love him so much. And we talk, we share I've invested, Sue and I have invested a lot into this young man. I love him so much. And the same issues that we have here, he's having there. The same thing. So it's not, sin is sin. You ever know that? Sin is sin wherever you live. You can go to the Antarctica, and if somebody's there, they got a sin problem. I mean, it's everywhere. The church is crippled and suffering, and our nation is imploding, dying from the inside because of our indifference and disregard of sin. To the point, and now we got, like I said, we got doctrine saying, well, sin's not an issue anymore. Sin's not going to separate you from God. That's where we're at in our Christianity. You see this picture? If you and I had been there, you would have had fear grip you to your bones. You would have been scared to your bones. No, this is not the Old Testament. This is the New Testament. This is the New Testament. And God used it to get their attention. Wow, if this would happen today, for one thing, the way it even happened, we wouldn't even let it happen like that. This is Ananias and Sapphira. Listen to this. But there was a certain man named Ananias who with his wife, Sapphira, sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. That's the sin. Now, you know what you're first thinking right now probably is? Well, that's not that big a deal. Right? It's really not that big a deal. If we, had, if, if, if we were a church, and we're not, but if somebody in the congregation said, you know what, I, I, I pledge to give towards this program, I'm going to give $1,000. And they end up giving 50 bucks. We wouldn't think anything of it. We wouldn't think anything of it. And I, that's maybe a real bad comparison. But now this isn't something real terrible. But you know what? Yes, it was terrible to God, 
that's where we're at. Our conscience has been so desensitized, we don't even know what sin is anymore. We're so desensitized to it. Claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell, or not to sell, as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. Did you ever think how much God hates lying? Did you ever think how much God hates lying? Oh, that was a little white lie. You know, I, it was a little white lie. What was white about it? Tell me what part of the lie was white. That's where we're at. <clears throat> as soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Now, you're in the group. Now, this is not long after Pentecost. I mean, it's not long. Pentecost has just happened. And there's been this remarkable birth of the church. I mean, it's powerful. And you're there, and all these things are happening that are just so powerful. And then this happens. Wow, what are you going to do? Well, one of the things that we would do today, for sure, is we would stop Sapphira. <laughs> if, she, if we knew she was coming, we would wait outside. The, you say, Todd, what's wrong with that? I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong, but God was trying to show his people something here. Now watch this. Ananias just drops dead. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some young man got up, wrapped him in a sheet, took him out, buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked, now, now let's just, let me just pause this for a second. I mean, come on, look at this. You would think, Peter was really wrong. I mean, he was wrong. He knew what happened to Ananias. He should have counseled Sapphira. He should have waited at the door and waited for Sapphira to come. And then when she came, just say, Honey, I got some bad news, and I need to talk with you. Well, that's not the way it went. That's not the way it went. So he asked her, Was this the price you and your husband received for your land? Yes, she replied. That was the price. And Peter said, How could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the Spirit of the Lord like this? What if something like this happened today? See, we can't even relate to this. It's real awkward. I, you, I know all of you feel real awkward right now. You think, Todd, are you, are you applauding this? No. I'm trying to say God hates sin. We don't care anymore. It's not that big a deal anymore. Sin destroys our families. It destroys our, our town, our city, our government, our nation. What about, listen, we can point our finger at, at our government, President Biden and the whole group, but why not just put the fingers back in your own face? Why not? There's sin rampant everywhere. And that's what the Bible says. It says sin will be rampant. We're living in it. We're swimming in it. We go to bed with it. And we really don't think that much of it. The young man who buried your husband are just outside the door. And they will carry you out too. Instantly. She fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And look what happened. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. God had a plan. He had a plan. We don't read where this happened anyplace else. I mean, if God did this all the time, there wouldn't even be church alive. I mean, everybody would be dead. Would everybody be carried out? But you know what? God was making a point. And, we, and we've lost the point. We don't get it because we weren't there. Maybe if it happened today and you were in the circle, maybe it would have an impact on you and me. But it still sings today. It still shouts today. What happened to many churches during the Depression? Think about this. The Great Depression started with the stock market crash of 1929. But we often forget it lasted 10 years until 1939. 
Not only was there 25% unemployment, but the price of some crops also dropped by 60%. Simultaneously, agriculture was devastated by the Dust Bowl, the result from decades of farming the Great Plains without resting the fields. Many lost their farm. Some people could no longer care for their children and place them in orphanages or sent them off to be adopted. Those were long, terrible years. Churches during this difficult time flourished, as the church historically has during war, famine, plague, and persecution. People, I'm, I'm bearing my soul to you. I'm, bearing, I'm, I'm speaking to you what I believe is the very heart of God. What makes you think that America is not facing something very drastic? What makes you think that we're just going to be fine? People are praying, you know, just praying. You know what? God says, you know, I'm really kind of tired of hearing your prayers. Why don't you get your face on the ground and start really confessing what's in your heart? Why don't you start repenting? And then I'll start hearing. Then I'll start listening. People, we've missed it. We've missed it. So many pastors are paranoid of losing members of the church. The goal is to grow their church numerically. Keep the people excited and happy. Preach the gospel, but avoid difficult passages and anything that could, call, that could be controversial. If America will ever change, it will only happen through godly sorrow and repentance. People, you can write that in your Bible because it's an absolute fact. It's an absolute fact. And don't think for a moment, well, Todd, there's, there's really great revivals breaking out. No, there's not. No, there's not. There may be excitement and crowds and singing all night long. That's not the same thing as awakening from God. It's not the same thing. Paul wrote this to the Corinthians. Listen closely. I'm not sorry. This is in 2 Corinthians. I'm not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you. Now, he could have been referring to 1 Corinthians because there were some really strong things said in that first letter. Or it could have been a letter that they just lost and we no longer have it. We don't really know for sure. I was sorry at first, for I know it was painful to you for a little while. Now I am glad, now I'm glad I sent it. Not because it hurts you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have. Now let me, I got to stop here. The American gospel says God doesn't want you to suffer. God doesn't want you to have any pain. You know, God wants his people to have godly sorrow. No, that's the devil. The devil wants to do that. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. People, do you see how twisted we've done things? The modern church thinking in most localities is absolutely been, it's been diseased for no smaller word. So you were not harmed by us in any way. For the kind of sorrow, listen, for the kind of sorrow God wants, wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. David, regarding the time Nathan the prophet came to him after he had committed adultery and murder, Uriah, adultery with Bathsheba. So this is in 2 Samuel. So the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David a story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised that little lamb and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He coddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day a guest arrived at the home of the rich man. But instead of killing an animal from his own flock and herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. 
Now, let me ask you a question. You can remember this. What was David's occupation before he ever was called to be a king? He was a shepherd. Did you remember when David did? Because he loved the sheep so much, he went out and killed a bear. A bear came after some sheep, and he killed the bear. A lion came after some sheep, and he killed the lion. That's a man who has great love for sheep. Now, when this story, when Nathan told David this story, David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you're the man. You're the man. I can't imagine the pain. You know, there are some, there are some psalms where David alludes to this, where he said, my, my bones, I, I felt like all my bones were drying up inside myself. Nathan didn't come to David just right away. God was giving David time to see what David would do. And David was sick. He was miserable, and he was sick. And there are psalms that bring that out. But finally, it, it reached a place where God had to send Nathan. You know, God knows the button in us that needs to be pressed. He knows the button. We need to let him press that button when necessary. It took this severe rebuke from the prophet Nathan for David to see and acknowledge what he had done. I want to read this to you because this is David's response. He put this in a psalm regarding Nathan coming to him. You know what this is. This is Psalms 51. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night against you, God, against you. And you alone have I sinned. I've done what is evil in your sight. Now all this time, David, it was eating him up, but he wouldn't say it. He wouldn't get it out. You will be proved right in what you say. And your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom, even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood. That's Uriah. Oh God who saves, then I will be joyful as saying of your faithfulness, forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O oh Lord, that my mouth may praise you. You do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, oh God. My dear friends, listen to me. If America would reach this place, there would be such a move across this land. It would, be, it would be greater than we've ever seen in our life before. You can holler, scream, rebuke the devil, do anything you want to do. But until you're broken, until you repent, until we just admit, oh God, oh God, oh God, what we've done to you. We've become so desensitized, so desensitized. desensitized. Listen, I'm asking you, I'm really strongly asking you to do something. 
I cry out all the time. You know, for the last eight years, I've been speaking things I've never spoken in my life. I've been crying out against the American I've been saying what God has been putting in me so deeply. And it's costly. I mean, it's not that big a deal. I'm not in Afghanistan or a place like that. But I've had all kinds of people just drop me. Don't want to be around me. Don't want to associate with me. Because Todd has lost it. Todd, something's happened to Todd. Yeah, something's happened to Todd. God Almighty really dug into me deeper than it's ever been. You know, I, in my Christian walk, and I can say this, and I'm honest about it. I gave my life to Jesus in February of 73, what I already told you. My walk has not been like this. It's not. It's not. I've never looked back. I've had a solid walk in the Lord. But until my plane crash, until I should have died, absolutely should have died, and God began dealing with me and made it so real to me that you should have died, Todd. You should have died. Now live like you're dead. Now live like you're dead. And, what, and that means, I didn't know what all that would mean. But it means you don't care. You no longer care what people say or think. The only thing I care about in my life is what God knows about me. I want to be obedient to Him. I really want to be obedient to Him. I hear very few people sharing the same things I am. And I cry out all the time. I say, oh God, if I somehow have deceived myself, God, you deal with me, be it ever so severely. Encourage me when I need it, but God, just don't let me, don't let me look back. And the other night, Sue saw this on YouTube. And she said, sweetheart, you got to watch this. you got to watch this. You know, we've seen these near-death things on TV, and most of them we hate because they're so demonic. They're so of the devil. I mean it. You talk about the devil appearing as an angel of light. When absolute lost people, lost people, talk about dying, and they saw this beautiful light, and this happened. You know what? I soon I, I think, oh, God! People are watching this and are thinking, well, that's no big deal to die and not be a Christian. It's no big deal. What lie from the pit of hell? But this man was so genuine and so real. You've got to watch this. When you watch this, your, your spirit is going to say yes and amen. This man had served God for many, 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 many years. He was also a policeman, and he was a, he was a lay speaker, pastor, and, he, and God dealt with him. And he said, God, I, I've done this. I've done. Remember in the scripture where it says, Lord, Lord, we did this, we did that in your name. And he's going to look at him and say, I don't know you. And this man said, God, look what I've done. He said, I know what you've done. And you've done it all for you. You've done it all for you. You didn't do it for me. You did it all for you. And his heart was crushed and broken. And what God showed him was just phenomenal. And when I heard him, he was saying things that I've been saying for the last eight years. And he said this 11 years ago. And I said, oh, God, thank you. You didn't have to do that, but thank you for just confirming that in my soul. If you go on YouTube, this is what you want to look up. Go on YouTube and look up near-death experience. This will leave all Christians in shock. Write it down, try to remember it, and watch it. I'm telling you, it's worth your time to watch it. I want to end with this, because what has all this meant tonight? What has all this meant about there's a famine? There's a famine in the land. And it's not for food and water. It's not for finances. It's for genuine repentance. Genuine repentance. And, and I know that everybody in this room loves the Lord. I know that. But you know what? Even as a Christian, you need to cry out what David cried out in Psalms 139. This is what David said. He said, search me. Search me, God. Search me. And know my heart. You know what? You don't know your heart. You agree with me? You don't know. The Bible says all of man's ways are right in his own eyes. I say that verse, I don't know how many times a week. It's so real to me. All of man's ways, all, not just a few, 
All of man's ways are right in his own eyes. But cry out to God, search me, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me. Wow, are you, are you willing to use those words? Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. I believe with all my heart and all my soul that we need to take the American gospel and it needs to be filtered. It needs to be filtered by the Word of God. Don't just take everything in until you really filter it against the Word of God.